Well, why don't we take a look at allergenic stem cell transplant, uh, transplantation. Uh, Dr. Pinner Brown, for the, the basics, who are the appropriate candidates? Well, I guess the first thing is you have to have a donor source. Um, you have to have um, no comorbidities that would prevent you from getting an allo transplant, like liver disease or cardiac or lung disease. And uh, I suppose there is still some ageism in, in a little bit. The younger patient would be preferable, though not uh, necessary. And uh, at my institution, it would really be uh, patients that either failed uh, auto transplant or couldn't collect. I think primarily who, who have demonstrated control of their underlying Hodgkin lymphoma. Any other any you other know, standards? I guess I'd put out to the group: is there is there an amount of chemotherapy in terms of regimens that one might fail, but where you would no longer look to an autologous transplant as a way to cure that patient, since it relies on chemosensitivity? And, and I, you know, I think we've talked about three lines of therapy, ABVD, a second line, and a third line of chemotherapy, and then start to think about novel agents that could be interdigitated to get disease control. I, I start to be very concerned that an autologous transplant is not going to be beneficial when three lines of chemotherapy have failed to get you into a suitable remission. I think at that point I am switching gears, and if there is an immunologic response with an allo transplant, that's the scenario where I'm more enthusiastic about thinking about I think it. that's very reasonable, but I think once again, just uh, to uh, you know, beat this down, uh, it's important to think of nodal versus extranodal Hodgkin lymphoma, because um, nine times out of 10, you'll have a patient who received ABVD alone for their treatment, then they received um, ice or some other platinum-based salvage regimen, and then they received another treatment, and they're still left with a four and a half centimeter lesion in the middle of their chest that's pet avid. And we shouldn't forget the fact that this patient can be radiated. Um, it's much different that, uh, if that patient has got that lump in the middle of their chest as well as a lump in the middle of the liver. Um, in that scenario, the, I, I agree with Dr. Hammond, the likelihood of an auto transplant um, achieving your goal is probably limited. I think there's one other consideration you alluded to. If, for instance, you get a response with some other type of agent that's not chemotherapy, let's say it's uh, an mTOR inhibitor, uh, does that translate into the same chemosensitivity? It's not really chemotherapy, and perhaps that would also lead you to think that an immune-based uh, method of consolidation or ongoing disease control might be more reasonable than to fall back on chemotherapy, which likely had failed. Otherwise, you wouldn't have used that agent. I think that's an actually very interesting point. Um, so for patients, for example, who fail an autotransplant, um, which is the setting that brentuximab adotin was approved for, there is a large cohort of patients who received uh, anywhere from three to nine cycles of that treatment who achieved a remission and then underwent an allo transplant, and actually many of them are out a couple of years now. So it may be in that setting that these novel agents post auto transplant, if uh, one achieves a complete response that you know you have to make your you're sort of at your decision tree at that point, um, either. And actually, Jonathan and I have debated about this um, in front of large audiences of what is the right thing to do. Should one just receive um, the continued investigational agent at that point, or should one then go to an allo transplant? And I would say we both can argue either side of the fence. It doesn't really matter, but uh, there are passionate oncologists on both sides of the fence. Well, let's, let's before we leave this, understand what we're talking about in terms of risk. Uh, Dr. Hamlin, can you tell us about the risks involved with this treatment? Uh, we have data on treatment-related mortality and morbidity and survival rates, graft versus host disease, graft versus lymphoma. Yeah, I, I, we, so we certainly are, are data-driven. Um, I think to, to frame it again, if we're talking about an allogeneic transplant for a Hodgkin patient, it is because their Hodgkin lymphoma is the most significant threat to their longevity. And the hope is that that offers a potentially curative outcome. So within that context, and knowing that that's sort of the backdrop when we talk about an allogeneic transplant, there are concerns. And, and the question really is, is, is the benefit from the allotransplant high enough to warrant a treatment-related mortality that at the best centers by two years is still about 20 to 30 percent? Uh, 
and an acute graft versus host disease and chronic graft versus host disease um, consequence that may limit your ability to participate on active new study drugs that are quite enticing because they may be durable in terms of their way of, of managing the disease. So I, I think there is a very long and informed discussion about the pros and cons to an allogeneic transplant that we have in every setting. But, but for me, that's really the crux of it. What I find interesting and obviously disappointing when I care for these patients is that the outcomes of allogeneic transplant in the Hodgkin lymphoma setting are really surprisingly poor in the sense that these tend to be the youngest patients we take care of. And yet, many of these patients experience significant morbidity and mortality from the procedure as compared with some of the other indications for allogeneic transplant. And no doubt that's because these patients have had all the other treatments we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's only so much therapy somebody can handle. But I think this risk discussion is, is a very important one because there are some patients who may choose not to proceed with this treatment if it's being done in a purely heroic way. Yeah, I'm also quite disappointed in uh, the role of allogeneic transplant for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. I, I think that um, the median time to fail a transplant is four and a half months. And if you, so that means you just got your high dose therapy, you were in the hospital for a month, then you've been recovering as an outpatient with your doctor. You just had your, your, your tests were done at 100 days post-transplant, and now three weeks later your disease is back. That's half the patients who fail. The best data in the literature for allogeneic stem cell transplant comes from Steve McKinnon from the University of London. And the, and the two risk factors to predict for a favorable outcome is a remission duration from your auto-transplant of one year so we're talking about 20% of the patients, and being in remission, which we probably can achieve with, with almost anything, to be honest with you, at 15 or 16 months post auto transplant. I'm more concerned about the 85% of the patients who fail within three to nine months if, after their auto transplant and what to do with those, and I haven't really sorted that out for myself yet. And you are gonna follow up. Um, how do you approach the follow up monitoring post transplant? Well, the good thing about transplant is that they have rules to follow. So no matter what, you're required to get a day 100 scan and you're required to get a one-year scan to report to uh, the bone marrow registries. So that's, that's a given. Um, and with Hodgkin lymphoma, the interesting thing is almost very few patients will relapse uh, two years post an autotransplant, less than 5% of the time. So. I think it's reasonable to image patients for the first two years, and then after that, you can, one can go with the flow, in my opinion. And in the option, or in the case of a relapse, what are your options at this point? Relapse after allogeneic transplant, yeah. functionally, most of those patients have an exceedingly poor outcome and are really not able to tolerate very much therapy. I think clearly the one therapy that needs to be considered is additional immunologic manipulation rapid taper of immunosuppressive medications and potentially donor lymphocyte infusions to try to maximize the effect of the allogeneic transplant. And if these patients have not had some of the novel er therapies like brintuximab vidotin, clearly one would think about those therapies. But in most cases now, I think those patients would have already seen that type of treatment. 